All right, everyone. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. And I'm going to talk about it through the lens of being a day trader. I'm a day trader. I've turned less than $600 into over $10 million in profit. And that's audited. These are my actual audit, um, my actual audit here of my broker statements that I do each year. So I think I qualified uh, to share with you at least my opinion of what I think this means for the market. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I've seen in the last week, it's been just over a week since the collapse. And uh, we're going to begin with the day of the collapse. This was last Friday. And uh, let's go ahead and jump in. And then I'm going to give you some of my commentary and a little bit of the back uh, backstory here. So this was on um, Friday morning, the stock was down 63% that last was that 63% on that last quote. So big drop the stock had been trading at over $250 a share and then in one day drops uh, after they gave some news which i'll talk about in a moment and then the second day it's continuing lower so people were saying ross uh it's moving should we be trading this should, should we be you know buying selling what's what's the trade what's the trade and my answer was uh this is not something i can touch so let's listen here so this is a very uh it's a it's a hot potato and these are the type of stocks that I think uh, while you can look at it and say, look, man, it just bounced from 34 to 39. Could have gotten a good piece of that. And I'm sure some did. I This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. I'm not willing to, you know, juggle knives for some quick little trade and risk a massive blowout. So sometimes there'll be something like this that is volatile, maybe is interesting, but is just not going to be something that I can have the risk tolerance to trade. So I leave it alone and I move on to something that actually fits within my wheelhouse. That's within the right price. That's trading in a predictable way, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, again, I, I have to check my bias. My gut is this is too risky. Don't trade it. Now that could be a bias that I formed. And if it is a bias, it is important to check that because maybe that bias is keeping me out of what could be a good opportunity. But on the other hand, they also say, trust your gut. So what if my gut is, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, I don't know, bias, a little bit racist against the uh, Silicon Valley Bank? I didn't mean to be, but it was just my gut. It's just the way it is. Well, do I trust it or do I, uh, you know, do I, do I try to fight it? And I'm not really, um, I, I think that I, at this point, have watched enough. Oh, it's halted. So right there, the stock got halted. Uh, it hasn't resumed. It's been over a week and it's probably not going to resume because the company has gone uh, out of business. They were taken over by regulators. They've collapsed. So if I was holding, if I had taken, and my average share size is 10,000 shares, but this is a more expensive stock. I usually trade stocks under 20. So a 10,000 share position at 20 is 200 grand. A 10,000 share position of this at 40 would be almost $400,000. Um, probably on something like this, I would have been trading more like four or 5,000 shares. So $200,000 on the line. Uh, and if I had taken that trade, that money would be gone. Shareholders are the last people in line to get bailed out or reimbursed in this type of situation. The first people that are going to get bailed out uh, will be the depositors, the people that actually had money at the bank. So uh, so the reason that I said I was not interested in trading this uh, was because I knew that this had the risk of being halted. And this is where educated intuition, it takes years of experience to develop and to refine. So this was why I was able to say, yes, it's my gut feeling that I shouldn't trade this. Uh, and I think it's more than it's more than just a gut feeling. It's based on some some actual uh, data. Right. So what I knew with this type of stock was we sort of had a couple of scenarios. Um, it was it was down a lot and there was a possibility that it would be subject to some type of bailout. And I wasn't sure if it would be a bailout on a, um, you know, federal government level or maybe a bailout by the stock getting acquired by another bank, because that can happen, too. So, you know, you could have a, a big investor, a big bank that comes in and scoops them right up if the stock gets halted and then news comes out that they've been bought out by, you know, whatever bank. 
And let's just say it could be for $50 a share. $50 a share is still a massive discount over the 300 it was trading at just like a week and a half ago. So if you were long, yeah, there you go. Maybe you're up 10 points a share. If you're short, maybe just like that, you're down 10 points a share. Or what could also happen is it could get halted and then news comes out that they've gone bankrupt or that they are getting a bailout or, or their, the bank has officially collapsed. Uh, and that was the case uh, in this example. So the problem here is that when I'm trading as a day trader, naturally, I'm thinking about risk and reward. And I'm willing to take a 5,000 share position and risk, let's say, 1,000 bucks. That's 20 cents a share. So if I got in at 39.40, my stop is 39.20. But there's that only works when I believe that I can actually stop out at that price if it starts to go down. If the stock has a risk of getting halted pending news, then suddenly that theory that I could manage my risk and stop out minus 20 cents is gone. I could end up losing 100% of what I put into the trade. And that there's no profit loss. I mean, well, I guess if I had the potential to get a 200% return from my entry and sell it at $120 a share, maybe you could say I could justify it, but, but that's not day trading and there's no way that I could. So for me, my gut told me to stay away from it. And I won't tell you that I didn't have some FOMO. I did. I was a little tempted. I saw some people who made money on it short. I saw some people who made money on it long. And in fact, in the last week, the traders who have made the most have been trading bank stocks. And you know what? The traders who have lost the most have also been trading bank stocks. These have been very volatile. There have been some big wins. And there have been some really big losses. This isn't the type of stock that I would typically day trade. Now, as a day trader, we're a hunter of volatility and we're a manager of risk. This does present volatility. Volatility equals opportunity. But it did not allow me to manage risk. Now, let's think back uh, not quite a year ago when we had this massive rally in the price of oil. So... Uh, We'll look here just briefly at USO, United States Oil Fund. Uh, so United States Oil Fund, uh, about a year ago, this thing goes, um, you know, sort of just like straight up. You could see this was 2022 and we just went up, 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 up. And we peaked right here um, in March. It's about a year ago. Um, and there were a number of small energy stocks that went crazy on sympathy. OK, this was um, an energy stock that went from about four dollars a share to ninety dollars a share. That was one of them. And there were there were dozens of them that made these kind of moves. Um, I don't have to go through all of them. It doesn't really matter. But this was this was what was happening in the market. So the thing there was that I was able to manage risk in a much different way. First of all, uh, we were dealing with a commodity that was going up, not down. So. I am biased to the long side. Uh, things going up are not subject to being halted and uh, going bankrupt or being subject to a bailout, regulatory bailout. So it's just not a concern. The market doesn't stop things going up, but it does stop things going down, right? That's just kind of, that's, it's just the way the market is. So with oil prices going up, we had a lot of opportunities on these other energy stocks, similar sector that were just going crazy, not because they actually had any other reason but they were sympathy momentum to a frothy hot market uh so that was a market where i was comfortable trading a lot of these stocks they and we i actually did very well this is different what we've got here with silicon valley bank sivb um si sivb collapsing this is something going to the downside but this has brought a lot of other banks with it uh, so this week uh, we saw Silicon Valley Bank drop, halted down. Signature Bank um, collapsed as well, got bought out. But we also saw FRC, a First Republic Bank. This one dropped from $120 a share down to like $23 a share. This one actually received from 11 of the big banks uh, a bailout of, I think, $30 billion. Oh, it's a cash infusion, I guess a loan of $30 billion. Um, Western Alliance, this one got a 5% stake by um, Citadel, which 
gave me some confidence that this was one that was maybe safer to trade and I did get a bounce on this. I thought, all right, if Citadel is stepping up to the plate and buying like 5 million shares or whatever it was, um, this is they've obviously done their due diligence. They're probably not concerned about this one uh, collapsing. So this one is probably the safest of of the um, regional banks that were dropping. So I did trade that one and I, I made some money on it. Um, Pac W, this was one that was also um, extremely volatile from 28 down to low of like five bucks and then back up to 10. Didn't feel very comfortable with this one either. The problem here is that for all of these stocks, uh, maybe perhaps, um, oops, sorry, I had my wrong chart up. Um, so this was um, Pac W, this was uh, Western Alliance, W A L, and this was FRC. So aside from uh, Western Alliance, uh, WAL, the other ones, I just was too concerned about the possibility that they would be next. This is the contagion effect. So what ended up happening over the last week was we were hearing um, all of these uh, small regional banks were just seeing a run on, de on depositors saying, I want my money back and I'm moving it to the big bank. Chase, Bank of America, you know, we're up to the big banks, essentially. And so with all of these um, regional banks, they had that same issue where there's a run on the bank. And what happened in the case of, well, so, so I'll get into that in a second. We'll talk about SIVB's specific case in a moment and why maybe that, um, th you know, th there's, you've got politicians who are saying and economists, this is isolated. These are isolated events. What happened on SIVB, Silicon Valley Bank, they exposed themselves, themselves to um, a lot of risk. They made some really bad decisions and that is their own fault. That's an isolated issue. Uh, but it also is showing one of the first consequences in a big way of um, monetary policy from the Federal Reserve. Uh, so we'll talk about how it ties back to that. But this week, from the perspective of day trading, I didn't do well. I was red this last week. And this is what I noticed. While I felt that, uh, so and I mentioned how I saw some traders who had some huge wins and some traders who had some huge losses on these bank stocks. I realized pretty quickly that I didn't feel that I was able to read the tape on these bank stocks. These are mid caps, uh, some of them even more like large cap, not quite large cap, but they're definitely mid cap stocks. Uh, smaller regional banks, but they're thickly traded, a lot of institutional traders, a lot of high frequency trading, and a lot of big money moving in and moving out. And the problem with big money moving in and moving out is that they send an order for 100,000 shares or 50,000 shares or five blocks of 50,000 shares to move in and out of a quarter million shares. That creates these short-term drops and pops. And we were seeing these flushes into halts down, and it would resume higher and halt up. And just not predictable price action. And so for me, I felt that even when I started to get comfortable that a stock was probably not going to be the next one to collapse and I could maybe trade it, I couldn't read the tape. You know, I'm a I'm a tape reader. And so if we look at um you know this uh, right here. Th this, as you as you see the orders um, flowing through, this is, would be tape reading. So let's see. I'll just mute this for a second. So the, reading the tape here is reading the, the order flow, and I found that it was very difficult to read the order flow on this. You've got ADFN orders going through out of sequence, and then you just had these big blocks going through. So I didn't feel like my technical analysis was really working very well on a stock that was being uh, sort of this, um, I don't know, just volatile and in um, a more of a fear-based way. So for me, the problem was I thought, okay, well, if I'm not comfortable trading these bank stocks, then what should I trade? And so on this particular day on Friday, I think it was I traded UNCY, uh, maybe a couple other stocks that were on the gap scanner. But the gap scanner didn't have much that was that was hot. There there really wasn't much that was moving on Friday other than the bank stocks. Monday I was green, but only small gains. It felt like the bank stocks were still all in focus. 
Same with Tuesday, same with Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's been the same. So this whole week has been so much of the bank drama. What's happened is it's kind of siphoned volume away from the small cap stocks I would typically be trading as um, traders have just been focused on these big, um, you know, these big, big bank stocks. And I feel like trading these big bank stocks has been a little bit of a trap because while they have liquidity and you could get in and out with 100,000 shares, they haven't felt predictable. So some of the people who have had some big wins on them, you know, had a little bit of they bought and all of a sudden, you know, they held and it just worked. And then some of the people that had some really big losses were the traders who were getting super frustrated. Like, I'm getting in for this breakout. This is a pattern. Why is it not resolving? And it's because there were forces in play that were um, much stronger than the technical analysis that we were that we rely on. So the result was dispersed attention. There were a lot of traders that were trading these bank stocks. I didn't like them, so I chose not to trade them. I trade stocks that fit more within my strategy, but those didn't perform as well because they were sort of in the shadow of something bigger that was happening. And I think I should have observed sooner that this might have been the type of week to sit on the sidelines until something really became obvious. There were a couple of good opportunities this week, but uh, but for the most part, it really wasn't a very good week for uh, for most small cap day traders. And again, for those that were comfortable trading the banks, they, I, I think they were maybe without realizing it, some of them taking a tremendous amount of risk because or certainly on Friday, Monday and Tuesday, we didn't know which one was going to be potentially next. And like I said, 10,000 shares of a stock like this is a lot of money. Even if you're only trading 1,000 shares, that'd still be $40,000 on um, SIVB. Losing that amount, it's just... Unless you're hitting $40,000 winners regularly, you shouldn't be taking that kind of risk. It just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. So this was a very difficult week. So what, do we, what, what should we plan for? What should we expect for the week ahead? Well, um, we had the FRC bailout uh, here, the $30 billion that, that went into that stock, but it hasn't really bounced that much. We have... Um, the economic policy with the Federal Reserve, uh, which this kind of ties back into the whole cause of this crisis here with Silicon Valley Bank, this was a niche bank that catered to venture capitalists and startups. So one of the things that's kind of um, interesting here is that a lot of a lot of startups ha will have a hard time opening bank accounts with big banks like your Bank of America or Chase. Because the big banks, they might not really understand the company. They're like, wait, you're you are involved with like a crypto, ex you know, something or other. Like, no, we want nothing to do with that. And so what ends up happening is uh, there's this sort of whole side business of banks that cater to um, the type of people that big banks disregard. They say, no, it's not going to work for them. And there's a lot of industries that are like that. So Silicon Valley Bank had been catering to startups and venture capitalists and startups specifically in the tech space. Now, they were catering to smaller startups. Look, look a big a big startup like a Airbnb or something like that. It would be crazy if they only had one bank. Most of those companies at that scale have many banks and most of them probably wouldn't use a bank like Silicon Valley Bank because they would get to a point where they really needed maybe some of the tools that a larger bank would have. Or, you know, that would support their, their business. So Silicon Valley Bank, therefore, was catering to a segment of the market, tech startups, that got hit hard in 2022. 2022 bear market, tech stocks got hit hard. People were very interested in investing in tech space in 2020 and 2021. And Silicon Valley grew, their, their deposits grew in those two years, I want to say by like four times, 400%. They went way, way, way up to over $200 billion. And with all that money that came in in the form of deposits, one of the things that they did, which was a mistake, uh, as it turns out, they invested in what they thought were low-risk treasury bonds. So they bought these treasury bonds. And the problem there is, you know, if you buy a treasury and it's a $1,000 bond and whatever, let's just say it pays... 2%, like 3%, three, 3%, three doesn't matter, it pays 3% interest. Uh, and then a year later, the interest rate goes up because the Federal Reserve increases interest rate and now it's 4% or 5%. You could buy a $1,000 bond today for that rate. So if you wanted to sell the $1,000 bond that you bought at a 2 or 3% interest rate, 
it's not worth a thousand bucks anymore because someone could buy a bond with a higher rate for the same price. So your bond value decreases and that's the face value, which isn't a problem if you don't need to sell it because when your bond matures, you'll still get your thousand dollars back. But if you need to sell it before the maturity date, you're going to sell it at a loss. And so it creates a, in a way, and this was the tough thing in 2022, because the Federal Reserve jacked up the interest rates, the bond markets went down and the stock market also went down. So traders who were diversifying their portfolio, you know, 60, 40, 70, 30 between equities and bonds, for instance, both sides went down. And that's really only a problem on the bond side if you have to sell. If you don't have to sell, then when, the money, when the, they mature, the full amount comes back. So with Silicon Valley Bank, what they also didn't expect was the, um, all the depositors, so many of them withdrawing funds because of the difficult market. So now they were forced to start uh, liquidating some of these positions. And so there was news on Thursday, I believe it was last Thursday, uh, that they had sold um, SIVB a portfolio of bonds and taken almost a $2 billion loss on it. It's a pretty big loss. Uh, so what they were doing uh, to mitigate that loss was they were doing a second a type of offering, trying to raise money on secondary offering to raise $2.5 billion. But that's a big offering, right? I mean, that's a huge offering. We, t we watch small cap stocks that do offerings sometimes and they're like, you know, a $5 million offering and the stock will drop like 40%. So a $2.5 billion, $2 billion offering, that's a lot of money. And they tried to do it, but they weren't able to find the investors to do it. And so then that's what created the panic. And even the fact that they were trying to do it created panic. And so on, I guess, Thursday, uh, people, depositors were trying to get their money out of the bank, get their money out of the bank. And then that's when all of a sudden they were, um, they, they, they ran into a crunch. Uh, they, had, they had no liquidity. And so they were taken over by regulators. So the fact is, um, we're now we're in this environment where the monetary policy uh, of trying to slow down inflation, you know, slow down inflation, slow down the job market. It's like the policy is now creating some of these some of these ripples. So this is the you know, this is some collateral damage and, you know, up to two, two million people losing their jobs in um, a labor slowdown would also be collateral damage. And it's the, you know, what they've said is there will be pain ahead, but um, it needs to happen. And the pain of not doing this would be even greater, you know, so they say. Uh, but, you know, of course, they also said that uh, inflation was going to be transitory. So it's really, it's, it, I think it's hard for a lot of, um, a lot of kind of regular Americans to feel like really confident, but also it's worth noting that uh, inflation here is a lot lower than it is in other countries. Other countries is a lot worse. Um, so, you know, maybe, you know, what they're doing is somewhat working. In any case, um, this drop has not presented opportunities that I felt were safe. Uh, very different from the spike that we had in oil last year. We may see at some point a sector of the market that starts to go up, um, you know, in response to what's happening here. There, there usually are some kind of, you know, balances, but I'm not sure what, what it's going to be just yet. Um, it hasn't been super clear. So the, the short term for me, as far as I'm concerned with trading, is that as long as we've got this drama going on with the banks, it's going to siphon off volume and liquidity into that part of the market. And it's probably going to make small caps more difficult to trade for a little while. I don't know how long that'll be. It might be another couple of days. It might be another week. It might be a couple of weeks. It has felt in the last, even Thursday and Friday, that the attention was less focused on the bank stocks than it was earlier in the week. Like it's already kind of like, I think, traders are losing interest and realizing that they are very difficult to trade and that the opportunities, while there may be some, certainly aren't without risk. So I think that traders will be eager to get back into the mode of trading volatile small caps. But uh, we are certainly faced with at least a little bit of a, um, a headwind while this banking 
distraction is going on. I would say this is a distraction in a way. I mean, it's it's easy for me to say that because it's distracting from the type of stocks that normally trade. It's certainly not a distraction for the market at large. I mean, maybe it is, but the market at large is definitely a serious event. But when we have these types of serious events, I usually find that it does make it more difficult to day trade. And this was um, the same at, if we look back at uh, 2020. So in 2020, we had this, uh, uh, you know, as you probably recall, this, you know, massive sell-off in the market. Market drops 30% in like a week and two weeks, whatever it was, very quickly. The month of February to March. And during this period right here, I didn't trade very well because everything was going down. And, you know, yeah, you, you could say, well, if you short everything that's going down, but you just never know when things are gonna bounce and you do have these big bounces. And we certainly did. And we certainly had them in the bank stocks as well. I mean, I saw traders who lost a lot of money trading them to the short side. You know, a stock's down 75% and you short it and then you still lose money. It's like, it's a weak stock on the verge of collapse, but it's no guarantee it's gonna be a winner, long or short. So anyways, I naturally find um, that I trade momentum better when the market is uh, in a rally mode versus a strong pullback. Now, just ordinary stuff like this, these kind of dips, that's that doesn't that's of no consequence. That doesn't do anything. But it's these big events like right in here. And there were some bigger events in 2018, uh, December right here. Uh, this was when the I think the Bitcoin bubble was bursting. Um, you know, there was another one there in January or February. So there's you know, there's been a few others, you know, over the years that I can recall. But um we're kind of in one right now because the overall market has broken down a little bit. We're obviously over a year into a bear market. And now as we're starting to see some of the um, some of the impacts, some more impacts of the monetary policy, there's definitely concern about, you know, how how far is this contagion spread? And so I think, you know, I have the sort of experience of coming out of college in 2008 2009 during the first during during that f first recession of my working uh, life i suppose you could say um you know the the dot com bubble bursting i don't really remember all that much but uh my experience of coming into the workforce uh during a recession definitely is probably one of the reasons that I became a trader because I wanted to be independent. I wanted to be responsible for my own income and not be dependent on someone else. And so that's something that I really do like a lot about the market and about trading. And I think that while there are certainly going to be weeks and months and years that are better than others, and 2023 may not go down as being, who knows? I mean, it's, the thing is at this point, it's like way too early to tell. I had no idea in March of 2020 that I was going to finish 2020 with like $5 million of profit. I had no idea. So I have no idea what this year is going to hold for us. And the fact is, I've seen how in one month I can, you know, make over a million dollars. So like I it's kind of like, well, whatever happens, happens. We, we could have a really slow year. And then in November, I could have, you know, from November to December, two amazing months. And this does kind of tie back to the 25 rule of trading that I talked about. If you haven't checked that out, I'll put a link um, right down below. It's, it's a rule of thumb that I've discovered in my own trading. Uh, so I'll pin that to the comments. I'll put it in the description. But the long and short of it is that I want to show up every day. I want to be present. And when there are opportunities, I'm going to try to capitalize on them. Right now, we're in a little bit of a distraction with what's going on with the bank stocks. So we're in a little bit of a, uh, a period where I might have to be patient. But there will no doubt be a lot of opportunities this year. The question is, can I be patient in between opportunities? And then when those opportunities strike, can I be a sniper? Can I get in? Can I be aggressive and trade them? That is going to be the goal for the coming weeks and months. So I don't want to run this episode too long. I think this gives you a good perspective of uh, what I sort of saw in the last week. Definitely a lot of choppiness in the small cap market as banks were in focus 
bit of a distraction, a lot of drama. You can wait for that to subside and wait for traders to come back into the small cap market in a more meaningful way. And that'll be obvious when we start seeing stocks going up 75, 80, 100 percent and more. It'll be obvious when it's happening. So when it's obvious, I'm going to step up to the plate and swing hard. That's it for me. Reminder, as always, trading is risky. My results aren't typical, so make sure you trade cautiously, and I'll see you for the next episode real soon.